Well, thank you all for hanging in to the bitter end there to hear about the James Webb uh, Space Telescope. Uh, I'm Matt Greenhouse, and I'm one of the project scientists uh, on the web. The web, as we call it, the James Webb Space Telescope, is the successor of the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. You might think of it as the replacement, but the Hubble people prefer the term successor. Uh, it will operate much the same way as the Hubble operates. Uh, astronomers from all over the world write proposals uh, to use the telescope. They're reviewed by a peer review committee. Uh, and then uh, the ones that are lucky enough to be accepted are uploaded to the telescope uh, and executed. Now, since those proposals haven't been written yet, uh, we don't know exactly what op uh, observations the web will make. Uh, and so we're really designing a capability when we design a telescope like the Webb or like uh, Hubble. And so to make sure we design the right capability, uh, we focused the engineering design on four science themes. Uh, identification of the first objects, the first luminous objects to form after the Big Bang, uh, to determine how galaxies evolved from the first uh, instance of their formation to those that we see today to observe the uh, birth and early development of stars and to observe how stars form planets and to study our own solar system and solar systems like our own uh, where the building blocks of uh, life uh, might be present. Uh, these th science themes are discussed uh, in detail in these two publications that are available for free on our website. This one is uh, more of a professional level and this one is an interactive uh, iBook that's available for free, uh, and it's quite fun to uh, look at because uh, you can actually interact with it. JWST was conceived in the uh, mid-90s, 1996, as a mission to connect the dots, if you will, between this famous image obtained by the COBE satellite for which a Nobel Prize was given. Uh, this is a picture of the oldest light in the universe. And this famous image, called the Hubble Deep Field, uh, which, uh, when it was taken, was the image with the largest look-back time obtained uh, by Hubble. And we're trying to connect the dots between these images in an evolutionary context shown on this cartoon. This is a cartoon of the uh, birth of the universe uh, in the Big Bang. Uh, and in the earliest parts of the universe, uh, the uh, gas was uh, totally ionized, but then as it cooled, uh, atoms were able to form, hydrogen atoms, so the uh, uh, universe became uh, opaque, giving rise to this cosmic dark zone. And then those spaces between the galaxies were re-ionized again, so the universe could, be, could become transparent. The photons could escape uh, to give us the universe that we have today. Now, the Hubble can only look back to about this point uh, in this history. COBE uh, and a more recent satellite WMAP has observed this epoch of the universe, but this epoch has never been seen before. And it's a very important epoch. It's the epoch where the very first stars and very first galaxies are formed. And it is uh, observation of that period in the evolution of the universe that the JWST is specifically designed uh, to accomplish. Now, when we say the JWST will observe the first galaxies, we don't mean that after its launch, you'll pick up a copy of the New York Times and see a picture of the first galaxy. What we mean is uh, that we will observe the rate at which stars are forming per unit volume in the universe, star formation per cubic parsec, as a function of look-back time, as a function of redshift. This is the state of our understanding of that now. And you can see as we look farther, farther, and back in time uh, with telescopes, we reach a point where the error bars get very big. That's speaking to the need for the JWST telescope. 
And JWST will be able to look back to redshifts uh, to about 20. And we expect to see a precipitous drop off in the star formation rate uh, in the universe. Uh, so we'll, we'll see a point where no more star formation is occurring. And then we'll know that we've reached the formation epoch. And then we'll study thousands of objects in that epoch to understand them in a statistically uh, significant way. Uh, so uh, how do we do that? What is this um, uh, reionization? This is a picture of a, of a volume of the universe with the very first galaxies in it. This is, of course, a cartoon. And as the, uh, those galaxies uh, produce ultraviolet light, they begin to ionize the neutral hydrogen around them to form these uh, ionized bubbles, kind of like the holes in Swiss cheese. And as this process continues, those bubbles coalesce uh, to, um, uh, to leave us with the spaces between the stars uh, fully ionized. Now, uh, before it's fully ionized, neutral hydrogen absorbs uh, ultraviolet light. And so if we make a plot of the ultraviolet light uh, from those galaxies, uh, brightness versus wavelength, there's a, a pronounced drop off in the brightness of the galaxies. And that's produced by the Lyman alpha absorption, as they call it, of neutral hydrogen. And as we look farther, farther, and back in time, the objects that we are looking at become more and more embedded in that primordial neutral gas. And this prominent feature in the continuum emission of the galaxies, one can see that red shifted. And this gives us a, a good way to measure the redshift of these galaxies. As we see that uh, break in the continuum, as astronomers call it, uh, farther, farther back in time, you can see that the galaxy will, be, will disappear uh, in filters uh, that are on the absorbed side of uh, that break and to produce uh, something like this. And so that gives us a very sensitive way uh, to look far back in time and measure roughly uh, the red shifts of galaxies. Here's some actual non-cartoon uh, pictures of that. A galaxy uh, observed uh, at, uh, with the Spitzer Space Telescope in the mid-infrared and in the Hubble Space Telescope in the infrared. And you can see this galaxy disappears as we go to a shorter filter, and that's telling us uh, the redshift of the galaxy. We'll be using that observing technique to know uh, how far away the galaxies are that we're observing. And we want the kinds of questions that we want to answer about those first galaxies are when did black holes form, and how did those black holes interact with the galaxies uh, that surround them? Well, you know, what's the nature of the first galaxies? When did this reionization process that I described occur, and exactly uh, what caused it? So we had to design into the JWST an ability for very deep near-infrared imagery. And uh, we had to develop uh, a technique for near-infrared uh, multi-object spectroscopy, as they call it. Spectroscopy that, uh, uh, in which we can observe more than one object at once. These galaxies are very faint, and it takes weeks and weeks of observing to uh, build up enough signal to noise uh, to get a spectrum of a galaxy. And so we've had to design instrumentation that allows us to take spectra of 100 galaxies uh, at once. And then we had to develop mid-infrared uh, capability and spectroscopy uh, uh, in the observatory. Now, JWST is also designed to observe the evolution of galaxies from their first formation. These are the shapes of galaxies that we see around us today, and you're familiar uh, with these spiral galaxies. Some have bars, some have bulges, uh, and so forth. But when we look at high redshift galaxies, very old galaxies, they don't look like this. They look uh, all beaten up. There's, there, it's a morphology that astronomers call irregular. And we'd like to understand uh, how that morphology turned into uh, this morphology. Uh, one way uh, that we uh, have determined that this can happen is collisions between galaxies. This is a computer simulation where every dot in this uh, image is a star. 
And you can see that through collisions, you can actually reproduce some of the irregular morphologies that we see around us. This is a particular galaxy called the antenna. And these are uh, pictures of uh, what Hubble sees uh, when it looks as far back in time as it could look. We want to understand how these galaxy shapes evolved into the shapes that we see uh, around us. So we want to know um, when the so-called Hubble sequence, the Hubble tuning fork diagram of, uh, of uh, modern galaxies uh, was formed. We want to understand how galaxies evolve chemically. And we would like to understand what powers the emission uh, from galaxies. And so we've had to design in wide field uh, near-infrared uh, imagery into the observatory. And we have to have an ability to take low resolution spectra of thousands of galaxies, as well as targeted observations uh, of their nuclei. Now, JWST will also observe how stars form uh, in our own galaxy. Uh, many of you know that stars form from collapsing clouds of molecular gas. The cloud starts to collapse on itself uh, from its self-gravity. And as it collapses and the pressure uh, in the center uh, becomes greater, the gas heats up to the point where fusion could occur and stars are ignited. So we know those broad brushstrokes about how stars are formed, but we don't know a lot of the details. We see that when stars are formed nearby, uh, very bright jets of emission are uh, produced, and uh, we need to understand more about the details of that process. Uh, we want to understand exactly how these molecular clouds collapsed. We want to understand how the environment of these clouds determines what kind of stars are produced. Will they be massive stars? Will they be stars like our sun? Or will they be very tiny uh, brown dwarf stars? And we want to know what debris disks around stars uh, tell us about the evolution of solar systems. When stars form, they typically have disks of material uh, left over around them, uh, disks of dust and rock and so forth. Uh, we made uh, the JWST an infrared telescope because to see the early universe, where the light was originally emitted uh, in the ultraviolet, as that light travels to us over the 13.7 billion years, it is red-shifted by the expansion of space. And so in order to see it, uh, we need an infrared telescope. To study star formation, it turns out that we also need an infrared telescope. This is a famous Hubble image of an object called the Eagle Nebula. And this is very dusty uh, clouds of molecular gas. The star formation is occurring. Uh, here, but we can't see it because the action is enshrouded uh, by that dust. Uh, but when we look in the infrared, we can see through the dust. And so that infrared capability also allows us to see the most obscured regions of uh, star formation. And we've had to put in a high angular resolution imagery across the uh, near infrared and high angular resolution spectroscopy. High angular resolution is the degree to which we can see fine detail. And so the JWST will have the same uh, angular resolution as the Hubble Space Telescope, but at a longer wavelength. This is an artist's conception of the debris disk around our own solar system. And this is an actual map of uh, where the debris uh, in our outer solar system lies. These are the so-called Kuiper Belt objects. And the JWST will be able to study these objects uh, largely for the first time due to its uh, high sensitivity and infrared uh, capability. We want to understand how planets form. Uh, when I was a graduate student, there were no planets known uh, around stars other than our own. Now there's more than 1,000. And so there's a whole new field of astronomy that's arisen uh, very recently uh, called exoplanetology. Uh, the compare study of uh, exoplanets and the comparison of uh, exoplanets uh, to each other and to our own. And we want to understand how planets form and how they form out of those circumstellar debris disks. This is a very famous spectrum. Okay, so these uh, bumps and wiggles are uh, light from individual atoms and molecules. And this one is uh, of a debris disk around a star 
uh, in the solar neighborhood. And this one is of a comet in our own solar system. And you can see they're very similar. And so uh, we know that we can learn a lot about, uh, about our own solar system and others uh, by studying these debris disks. There's a real connection to our own debris disks and the ones we see around uh, other stars. The high angular resolution of the JWST will allow us to see planets directly. Um, this is a famous image of a star called Fomalhaut. And this is a Hubble Space Telescope image. And this is the debris disk around Fomalhaut. And you can see this point source here uh, observed in two different epochs. That's the first image of a, of a direct image of a planet orbiting uh, another star. And uh, this is a picture of uh, Fomalhaut measured in 24 microns wavelength in the mid-infrared with the Spitzer telescope. This is invisible light with the Hubble. And this is a simulation of what JWST will see at about the same wavelength as Spitzer. So you can see uh, how JWST will bring uh, to the table, if you will, unprecedented angular resolution uh, in the infrared that will be so important uh, for observations like this. Now, JWST uh, will do something very remarkable in the exoplanet uh, area. JWST will actually be able to obtain spectra of the atmospheres of exoplanets. And it will do that uh, with a relatively new technique called exoplanet transit spectroscopy. Sounds complicated, but it's really very simple. Uh, planets uh, orbiting around another star will sometimes pass uh, between uh, the star and us along our line of sight. So imagine in this cartoon we have this configuration. We have a star, we have a planet, and we have a spectrometer. Now, uh, before the planet moves into our line of sight, we have the light from the star entering our spectrometer. We take a spectrum. Then we wait for the planet to move into position. And now we have the star plus the light of the planet, plus the uh, light is passing through the atmosphere of the planet. So we have the sum of those two things. We take another spectrum. We take their difference. We subtract those two spectra. And what we are left with is the spectra of the atmosphere of the planet. And this has been done with the Hubble Space Telescope a lot. And so we have actually been able to measure the chemical composition of the atmospheres of planets orbiting other stars. It's a quite remarkable thing. And it is uh, in this way that it's possible that we will first find life on a planet around another star by seeing uh, emission lines that reveal uh, uh, chemistry that uh, can only be explained by biological processes. That discovery hasn't been made yet, but it's possible that JWST uh, will make it. Now, JWST is uh, remarkably more sensitive than any other facility. In this plot of sensitivity, as astronomers uh, plot it, down is more sensitive. And so you can see uh, JWST is much more sensitive than the Hubble Space Telescope, than the Spitzer Space Telescope, than uh, giant ground-based telescopes for either imagery or spectroscopy. And uh, one can also see the importance of space astronomy relative to ground-based astronomy. This is a, a, a plot of the background emission uh, that one sees when a telescope uh, looks at the sky as a function of wavelength. All this hash that you see here is due to uh, molecular emission and absorption uh, in our atmosphere. So uh, telescopes that are on uh, one of the highest observatories on the Earth, Mauna Kea, have to look through all this stuff. Whereas in space, we see this background. And you can see that these two curves start to diverge at a wavelength of about uh, two microns. So longward of two microns, uh, JWST has uh, an insurmountable sensitivity advantage over any telescope that can be built uh, on the ground. And this is why we uh, go to space with telescopes. Now, to do all that science, we have to build the largest cryogenic telescope ever constructed. 
and turns out it's the largest cryogenic anything to ever uh, fly in space. What does it mean, cryogenic? It means very, very cold, uh, 40 or 50 degrees above absolute zero. Why do we have to make it cold? Because everything at room temperature, everything above absolute zero, emits infrared uh, radiation. If we had infrared goggles on, all we would, everyone in the room would be glowing. And so if we don't cool the telescope to a very low temperature, it would be blinded by its own infrared emission. To see the light of the first galaxies, we need seven times the light gathering power of the Hubble Space Telescope. We want to have the same angular resolution. So both of these things uh, require a very large mirror, a mirror that's much, much larger than the Hubble Space Telescope. And it turns out that the mirror that we need is bigger in diameter than the biggest rocket that exists. And so that was one of the early problems that we had to face in designing the JWST, is how do we put this big mirror, in the, the whole telescope that big, in a rocket that's less, smaller in diameter than that? And you'll see how we do it in a few minutes. Uh, this is uh, just another illustration of the importance of angular resolution. This is a, uh, a picture uh, taken by the Spitzer Space Telescope uh, at a wavelength of about four microns of a particular field uh, in the sky. And this is a simulation of what JWST will see at that same field. And you can see uh, uh, how much more detailed uh, the JWST image will be as a result of having this uh, large mirror. Now, uh, the, how would we cool uh, something this big. That was the next problem that we had to face. This JWST is over six metric tons. And to cool it uh, to 50 degrees above absolute zero was a problem that we had to figure out how to solve. There is no refrigerator that can cool something this big. So it can't work like a refrigerator at home or any special uh, cryogenic refrigerator. So we had to come up with a technique to passively cool the observatory. And it works like this. The JWST will not orbit the Earth like the Hubble. It will go to a special spot in space uh, about 1.5 million kilometers in the anti-Sun direction uh, from the Earth called uh, the second Lagrange point of the Earth-Sun system, or L2 uh, for short. And it will orbit the L2 point uh, here. Now, we like that configuration, and we like that place in space, because you can see that the sun and the Earth and the moon are always in the same direction. So we will deploy a giant sun shield, sun shield that's nearly the size of a tennis court. And we have a requirement that the telescope always live in the shadow of the sun shield. And in the shadow of the sun shield, it will cool to desired temperature by simply radiating to the cold darkness of space. It's very important that the sun never shine on the telescope. If it does, the telescope will break. And so we've sized this sun shield so that the telescope can point five degrees toward the sun, and no sun will hit the telescope. And it can point 45 degrees away from the sun. When I say point, we're body pointing the whole vehicle. And at 45 degrees away, no sun will shine on the telescope. So we've now observed an arc on the sky 50 degrees wide. Now, you can imagine that we can rotate about the Earth-Sun line. And that won't cause sun to shine on the telescope. So now our arc is turned into an annulus. That annulus, the, the $5 word for that annulus, is called the field of regard. It's the uh, region into which we can point the telescope at any instant, and that covers 35% of the sky. So at any moment in time, we can point the telescope at 35% of the sky. And then over a course of the year, uh, this orbits about the ecliptic pole, and that annulus sweeps out the whole sky. So uh, every year, we can point at any place in the sky. And you can tell, see that there's a few uh, little zones at the poles that are continuously viewable uh, all the time. Now, the JWST project is the largest science project that the United States is doing today. 
and that the United States has ever done in its history. It's much too large a project for any agency to do by itself, and so it's a partnership among NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency. The Canadian Space Agency is providing uh, a, the fine guidance sensor, which also does some science. That's the sensor that allows us to point the telescope. The European Space Agency is providing one and a half science instruments, and they're also providing the rocket. And then NASA is doing everything else. The JWST consists of three big elements. The telescope element, the science instrument payload, or instrument module, as we call it, and then the spacecraft. Uh, and this is a, a scale model of the telescope that we sometimes uh, haul out to show people uh, how big it is. This is the JWST folded up inside the fairing of the Arian 5 rocket. Uh, it does fit in there. This is it in end view. There's not a lot of room to spare. Uh, but uh, it fits inside that rocket. This rocket will not launch from Cape Kennedy, but rather from Kourou Launch Center in French Guiana, which is on the east coast of uh, South America. The whole observatory is 6.5 metric tons, and as I said, it will cool passively uh, to 50 Kelvin. We're going to the uh, L2 point, and we're very happy with this rocket. Uh, you might think we'd be nervous about putting something as expensive as a JWST on a foreign rocket, uh, but this Arian 5 is uh, really the most reliable heavy lift rocket of its type uh, in existence. It's had 42 consecutive successful flights in the specific configuration uh, that we need for JWST in a very full manifest leading up to the uh, time of the JWST launch. So let's take a look at uh, how uh, we get this telescope deployed from its folded up condition. So the JWST doesn't orbit the Earth even once. Uh, and it, this is coming off the rocket. And you can see mission time here. And so here is the JWST. The first thing that happens is solar arrays deploy, so we can become power positive. We're running on batteries up to this uh, point. And then uh, certain launch locks release. Uh, these are uh, locks that hold things together during the violent burn portion of uh, spaceflight. We have to make some uh, course corrections to uh, ensure that we actually end up at the uh, L2 point uh, that are critical. Uh, this is the moon here. And then uh, we have to deploy the high gain antenna so that we can begin uh, really communicating uh, with the JWST. Uh, before we deploy that antenna, we're using a series of relay satellites called the TDRIS system. And uh, so uh, we're now passing the farthest point. Uh, that astronauts have uh, reached. The astronauts can't go to the L2 point. Uh, some people have asked, uh, can we service this if it doesn't work? The answer is no. We have to make sure everything uh, works right or will be sunk. And what you see happening here is uh, this is the membrane management system for the giant sunshade uh, starting to uh, unfold. Uh, the sunshade is uh, folded up inside these pallets and uh, you will see it start to deploy uh, in a few minutes. We're uh, just starting about day three after launch now. This telescoping tower deploys to give us good thermal separation between what will be the cryogenic part and what will be the room temperature part, this spacecraft bus here that resides on the sunny side of the sunshade. Now this is uh, covers that uh, release through uh, their own shape memory. So now where the uh, sunshade is uncovered and uh, it will begin to deploy. We have to manage this giant membrane very carefully so that we're sure uh, it will not become fouled uh, during the deployment. So you're seeing these mid-booms, as they're called, start to telescope out 
uh, on each side to cause the sunshade uh, to spread out. Now, to get the thermal performance that we need from this sunshade, it has to have five individual layers in a very special shape. And so now you're seeing these five layers uh, start to separate. The angle between the layers is very important uh, because the uh, thermal radiation from the sun that it blocks escapes out the edges through that precise opening. Uh, this is also a giant uh, sail, so there is a trim tab that you saw there that's important for us controlling uh, the momentum imparted on JWST by the uh, solar sail effect. And so uh, now that the sunshade is deployed, the observatory is already starting to cool. We do have a mechanical cryocooler that cools one of the science instruments. We started at this point. And now we're going to start to deploy the telescope. So there is the secondary mirror of the telescope uh, deployed. And you'll see the wings of the primary mirror uh, start to deploy. That was a thermal radiator that comes out. Uh, and now this mirror uh, deploys sort of like, the, uh, like a drop leaf round kitchen table. We're about eight days into the mission at this point, and then we go through a long period where not a lot happens. And then at about 29 days, we fall into orbit uh, about the uh, L2 point. Now, we're not exactly at the L2 point. We orbit about it, and the reason for that is that we have to stay out of the Earth's shadow. The reason that we have to stay out of the shadow is we're generating electricity with solar arrays. And so uh, we orbit uh, about the, point, the L2 point to stay out of the shadow. Now, you'll notice that the JWST mirror is not a single piece of material. It's 18 hexagonal segments. So we have to adjust those segments so that they play together as a single mirror. Uh, each segment is mounted on a mechanism called a hexapod that allows us to adjust it in six degrees of freedom, you know, tip-tilt on all three axes, plus radius of curvature. So we have seven degrees of freedom. So once we deploy the telescope and we point at a star, we have 18 separate telescopes and 18 separate images that we have to combine. And uh, we go through a sequence of activities that adjust each of those segments so that we superpose all those images uh, to create a single uh, image uh, that has what scientists call a strel of 0.8 at 2 microns. Strel of 0.8 means 80% of perfection. A perfect image would have a strel of 1. So we have a nearly perfect image at a wavelength of uh, uh, 2 microns. Uh, one of the key things that we have to do is adjust the piston alignment of those segments to create a single surface. And uh, we do that by putting special optics in one of the infrared uh, cameras uh, called a dispersed Hartman sensor. These are a series of grisms that are prisms with some uh, grading rules on them that span the joints in all of the segments and then produce an interference pattern that tells us about the piston alignment. So we can adjust it that way uh, to uh, achieve that perfect image. Now this is very complicated and we had to convince ourselves and convince a lot of other people that uh, we knew what we were doing and that we could actually make this work. And so we built a one-sixth scale fully functional model of the JWST to demonstrate uh, all of our software algorithms and procedures uh, for doing uh, that phasing of the telescope and combining of the 18 images. And we maintain this at Ball Aerospace in Boulder, Colorado, uh, to use it for anomaly resolution uh, in orbit. Now, the JWST mirrors are not made of glass. They're made of a, a metal called beryllium. And the reason we chose beryllium is that as we slew the telescope around the sky, there are temperature gradients that form in the mirror. And so we wanted to choose a material that had a low 
coefficient of thermal expansion at the operating temperature of the mirror. So we wanted to choose a metal that didn't change shape with temperature at 50 Kelvin. It turns out beryllium is the ideal material for that. Beryllium is also very light. And uh, when we make things to fly in space, weight is a premium. And so uh, we choose a very light material. After we make the mirror, we machine away almost all the beryllium uh, to produce this very lightweighted structure. And one of the figures of merit that we talk about for how well we're doing at minimizing the weight of the primary mirror is the aerial density of the uh, primary mirror. Uh, the uh, uh, grams per unit area of the mirror. With this mirror, we achieve uh, 28 kilograms per square meter. And you can compare that to the Hubble. It's about, Hubble is about six times heavier uh, than the JWST. And a, a ground-based telescope uh, like the Keck, which is made of a glass called Zerodor, is about 70 times heavier. Now, this mirror is going to operate near absolute zero. And although we've picked a material that doesn't change shape a lot once you get it to 50 Kelvin, of course, it does contract a lot when you cool it from room temperature. And we're going to polish the mirror at room temperature. So if you think about this for a little while, you realize that we have to polish the wrong shape into the mirror at room temperature so we get the right shape at the operating temperature. That's easier said than done. And it involves a lot of computer modeling and testing. And so uh, we followed a procedure uh, where we would polish the mirrors you know, almost all the way. And then we would put them in a specially uh, instrumented uh, cryogenic vacuum chamber at Marshall Space Flight Center to see how our polishing was tracking with our computer model when we cool the mirrors to the operating temperature. We'd make uh, corrections to our model and then ship the mirrors back to the polishing house and repeat that procedure uh, one more time until it was all done. So that work is, uh, is all finished now. The JWST telescope is what we call a three mirror in a stigmat. That's the type of telescope that it is. And uh, it works like this. Light from the star comes and reflects from the primary mirror. It then goes to the secondary mirror and forms a focus in front of the primary. But then we let it go on to a tertiary mirror, then to a fine steering mirror. This is an articulated mirror that will allow us to mitigate the effects of vibration in the telescope due to machinery running in the spacecraft. And then that light goes to the focal surface where the science instruments are. So all these mirrors are done. All these mirror assemblies are done. This has all uh, been delivered. They're all in spec. Uh, and the reflectivity of the mirrors exceeds spec throughout the uh, whole operating range of the uh, JWST. JWST will work from 0.6 microns, which is in the red part of the visible, to 28 microns, which is in the mid-infrared. The telescope structure, again, to make it light enough, we couldn't build it out of aluminum. We had to develop a special uh, composite material, a carbon-reinforced composite material. And this is the telescope structure. It consists of over 3,000 bonded parts. So the parts are glued together, if you will, uh, on a special mandrel to form the telescope structure. All that work is done, and of course, this all has to be tested at the operating temperature, and that testing uh, has been done. So the telescope structure is ready. This just gives you a, a sense of how big the JWST is. This is uh, a wooden mock-up uh, that's used to practice uh, handling procedures. And this is actually a Pathfinder model. This is a, a functional uh, model, an engineering model, if you will, of the uh, center section of the back plane, the structure behind the primary mirror, and the secondary uh, support structure. You can get a sense of just how large this observatory is. Now, JWST sunshade, it has an SPF of a million. <laughs> if you had this on the beach, you would be very well protected. And uh, it's, a, it's uh, one of the riskiest parts of the JWST and the most critical parts. If we don't properly block the heat from the sun, 
and if any unwanted thermal energy leaks in there, uh, the telescope won't reach the desired temperature and we, the instruments won't work the way they should. It really is pink like this. The sunward facing uh, layer is covered with silicon, which gives it this pink color. The material is a plastic material called Kapton, and all the other layers have uh, aluminum vacuum deposited uh, onto them. This sunshade is too big to test anywhere. And so we had to convince ourselves that it would give us that SPF of a million by building a one-third scale model which we could test in a space simulation chamber. Uh, this is a picture of that uh, test article. And this is a, a full-scale uh, membrane of the uh, JWST actual uh, sunshade. This is a person standing here. And uh, this is a curved uh, membrane. You can't make a curved um, shape out of flat material without wrinkles. And so this is actually a quilt of uh, many, many pieces. They're not sewn together, but they're thermally spot welded together. And uh, the membrane is tensioned by a wire that is uh, embedded in the plastic that forms a shape called a catenary uh, when it's properly tensioned. So let's look at the business end of the telescope. Uh, this is the science instrument uh, package. This is the part of the telescope that uh, I'm responsible for. And we call it the Integrated Science Instrument Module. Uh, it's about 1.4 metric tons of that six, six and a half uh, metric tons. And it's completely finished now. It consists of uh, five sensors, four of them for science and one for pointing uh, the telescope, and nine other systems that help those sensors uh, work in space. And of course, it resides on the business end of the telescope. So the first is the infrared camera. Uh, this camera will provide the deepest infrared images ever obtained. It will look back farther in time than any uh, observatory uh, like this before. It'll see that cosmic dark zone. And it will identify uh, the primeval galaxy targets for the spectrometer to obtain uh, spectrum of. It was uh, developed by the University of Arizona with Lockheed Martin. It works from uh, 0.6 microns to 5 microns. It has filters, it has uh, spectroscopy, and it has a coronagraph. The coronagraph is used for observing uh, extrasolar planets to block the light of the uh, star that they're orbiting. It has a very large field of view, 2 by 4 uh, arc minutes, a resolution of uh, about 32 milliarc uh, seconds, at the uh, short wavelength side of the instrument and about twice that at the long wavelength side. The detectors here are produced from an alloy of mercury, cadmium, and tellurium to produce detectors that are sensitive to this uh, wavelength of light. It has quite a large number of them and they all work at about 40 uh, Kelvin. This instrument uses lenses and it's all made of uh, beryllium. And it's a fully redundant system. There are two of these back to back. And the reason we made it fully redundant is uh, it's the, also the wavefront sensor for the observatory. So it's the sensor that allows us to phase those 18 uh, segments. And we have to do, adjust that phasing every few weeks. So we need to have this working uh, for the whole duration of the mission. That's what it looks like, uh, the two uh, redundant uh, units of the instrument back to back on this uh, beryllium uh, bench. Now the near spec is the first multi-object spectrometer to fly in space. Uh, this uh, is a spectrometer that's designed to observe a hundred targets at a single time. It's got a very unusual method of doing that, so this is how it works. Light from the telescope comes to a pick-off mirror and is re-imaged onto a point here. And at that point, we have an array of microscopic shutters. So this egg crate structure like this has a little trap door in the bottom of every cell that can be opened and closed under computer control. So we form an image, just like this, on the surface of this big micro shutter array. And then if, let's say, we want a spectrum of that object, that object, and that object, we open those trap doors under those sources that we want, 
and that lets light into the conventional grading spectrograph such that each object gets its spectrum dispersed along its own row of the detector. And that's how we'll get that uh, multiplexing advantage of uh, being able to observe 100 objects uh, at once. It's uh, part of East, the European Space Agency's uh, contribution uh, to the mission, so they made this instrument. And one, another unusual thing about the instrument is that the whole thing is made of an advanced ceramic material called silicon carbide. When I say ceramic, you know, think your bathroom tile. So you can't drill and tap holes in, in that material, so this whole instrument is held together with friction. ESA built the instrument, and uh, it's all ceramic, even the uh, optics and the bench and everything. NASA's uh, uh, contribution to this instrument is we invented this micro uh, shutter uh, technology, and we're also providing the detectors. So we have a quarter million of these uh, micro shutters in an array uh, here, and that gives us the flexibility to adapt to whatever pattern of targets uh, that we want to observe. This is a little bit more about those, how those micro shutters uh, work. This is the diameter of a human here, and uh, this is one of these shutters. And uh, the way it works is like this. They're made of silicon, and they're patterned out using um, um, microlithography, the same sort of process that are used to make uh, electronic circuits. And we have these blades of silicon that are mounted on a torsion hinge. And on the silicon, we have magnetic material. And so we open the shutters by scanning a permanent magnet across the surface. That causes all the shutters to open, and we electrostatically latch them open to the walls of this egg crate structure. So we sweep the magnet across, all the shutters are open. And then we can individually address the ones that we want to close and release the electrical bias that holds them open, and they'll snap closed. And that way we can make an, any pattern of open holes that we want. And this is what that actual uh, hardware looks like. This is one of 10 technologies that we had to invent to make uh, the JWST mission possible. This is what that instrument uh, actually looks like, and it was delivered uh, this past summer. And then we have the mid-infrared instrument. Uh, this instrument is uh, very important for uh, making sure that we can really tell the difference between truly primordial galaxies, galaxies whose stars have nothing but hydrogen, helium, maybe a little bit of lithium, from uh, more younger galaxies that just happen to be really red because they contain a lot of dust. Uh, this wavelength region that this instrument covers from 5 to 29 microns is critical for making that determination. And so this instrument is a partnership between uh, 10 European countries uh, and uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And it does imagery and spectroscopy uh, throughout this wavelength range over a fairly large uh, field of view, about two by an arc minute uh, and a half. Uses a different kind of detector, silicon doped with arsenic, and these detectors have to run colder, uh, about 7 Kelvin. So to get from the nominal 40 Kelvin uh, temperature that we achieve passively to 7 Kelvin, we are using a mechanical cryocooler to get that last little bit of cooling uh, for just this uh, instrument. And uh, this instrument is all made of aluminum, uh, so it's, uh, it's lower tech in that regard. And then finally, this is Canada's contribution uh, to the instrument. This is the fine guidance sensor, what enables us to lock onto a star and point the telescope. This sensor uh, can measure changes in pointing of about a millionth of a degree. And uh, it, uh, so it's a fine guidance sensor, and then there's also a science instrument also on the optical bench. So one side is the sensor, the other side is the science instrument. And that science instrument is designed specifically to do that transit spectroscopy I mentioned, where we can get the spectra of extrasolar uh, planets. So now all the bits and pieces of the instrument payload uh, have arrived at Goddard. And this is pictures of us putting it all together uh, to put that payload uh, into its uh, first space simulation test. So this is what the science instrument payload of the JWST uh, actually uh, looks like. It achieved 
uh, 100% integration, as we say, meaning it's 100% assembled uh, for the first time uh, last month and uh, now ready to uh, test it. So to test it, we have to simulate the space environment. And so we will do this in what's called a space simulation chamber. It is a giant vacuum tank. So with the vacuum tank, we could simulate the vacuum of space. But to simulate the low temperature of space, we have to put in shrouds, as they're called, uh, that are cooled with liquid nitrogen and liquid helium. So the uh, payload thinks it's surrounded by the cold uh, vacuum of space. Uh, we feed the optical beam into it with a simulator of the JWST telescope. It has to be a very high fidelity simulator, which sits on vibration isolators that also are working in this simulated space environment. So this is a very complicated and difficult uh, test setup, and it's what we're going, the ISOM will be going into uh, in June. This is a picture of what that test setup uh, actually looks like. This is a test we did uh, in 2012 to uh, check out that telescope simulator with a special instrument in place of the ISOM to measure the fidelity of that telescope beam. And you can see the complexity of, uh, of the setup inside this chamber. These are the most complicated uh, cryogenic tests that NASA has ever done. While this is happening, we're also putting together the telescope in a giant clean room uh, at Goddard. And to facilitate that, we've built a giant assembly stand. The telescope will sit inside that assembly stand. And a special robotic arm has been designed to help us pick up and place each of the 18 segments of the mirror and integrate them to the back plane uh, structure. And so uh, that'll be happening uh, as we're uh, testing the ISOM. Then we will attach the ISOM after it completes its test to the telescope to produce a level of assembly that we call OTIS, so the telescope plus the instrument payload. And we want to test that, uh, but we have to use an even bigger vacuum chamber at Johnson Space Flight Center near Houston, Texas. So we have to put that payload in a specially designed container that maintains the, the very, very clean, carefully controlled environment that it needs. So this big truck is that container. It fits into a C-5A aircraft, and it will fly from uh, Goddard, which is near Washington, D.C., to Houston to be tested uh, in a truly ginormous uh, vacuum chamber, which is called Chamber A. So the chamber we looked at a few slides ago would actually fit through this door. And uh, this is left over from the Apollo program. And we've completely refurbished it for JWST. And the test set up here will look like this. Uh, the JWST will roll through this door on rails. And it will look up at special optical test equipment at the top of the chamber and we'll do what's called an end-to-end -end optical test. Now, that's a test we didn't do on the Hubble Space Telescope with consequences that I think you're aware of. <laughs> we can't fix this thing, so we're not skipping uh, that test on JWST. So again, we go back into the C5A after that test is finished and fly the payload over to Los Angeles, California where it will be, have the spacecraft attached to it. And then we put it in a specially designed ship. So this truck, this is called a RORO ship, meaning roll on, roll off. So this truck will actually drive into the ship and park. And then it will leave from Long Beach, California, go through the Panama Canal to French Guiana to the launch center, a journey of about 6,900 nautical miles. At 15 knots, it'll take 20 days uh, to get there, and then we'll launch it in space uh, from there. So if you go to our website, which is easy to remember, just jwst.nasa.gov, you can get a lot more information about the JWST. We have a webcam that looks into the giant clean room where we're doing a lot of this work, and it serves a still image every five minutes. So you can sort of see the JWST. You can watch the work uh, as it's actually happening. 
As I mentioned, you could read more about the JWST science missions on free material on our website. Uh, if, you, if there are any astronomers in the audience and you're planning to use this telescope, you can start to look at uh, your science objectives. Uh, we have uh, telescope time estimators, as they're called, tools that will tell you how long a given observation will take on the JWST. So you can begin thinking about your science, and those tools are available here. And then we have a, a, a team of scientists that oversee the whole project. They're called the JWST Science Working Group. They're spread all over the country. No matter where you come from, there's one near you, and they would love to hear from you. So if you have questions about JWST, you can see how to get a hold of them at this website, and you can write to them, and they'll actually write back and answer your questions. So uh, that's the end of this talk. But with JWST, we're going to literally see uh, the beginning of everything. Okay.